Welcome to the Ocean International Community Church. So we're on week three of our Timeline to the Messiah series, where we've been walking through this timeline, right, of of sin all the way to salvation. And that's kind of the story of the Bible, isn't it? The story of the Old Testament walking in through to the New Testament, sin to salvation, our timeline to the Messiah. And if you were with us on week one, we talked about sin. Sin entered the the story pretty early into the creation of the world, didn't it? First, God created the world, and then God created man, and then God rested. And then God created woman, and then man and woman together created this mess of sin that we see now in the world. The entrance of sin brought wars and famine, diseases and death. When we think about sin, we think dark and evil, don't we? Isn't that the, the thought that we have? But really, sin likes to package itself, doesn't it, in this, in this shiny, happy, fun package. Oh, here's this fruity drink. And, it, and, you know, it'll make you feel good. You've had a stressful day. You deserve to relax a little, don't you? We know how to package sin to make it enticing, to make it exciting. Sin is around every corner, and it's right at the center of who we are in our fleshly hearts. We also talked about free will, didn't we? We talked about how God had to give Adam and Eve the opportunity for free will in order for there to be true worship. For without free will, worship is not true. Last week, we talked about the law. If you were with us, we talked about how God had to give the Israelites the law in order for them to know how to follow and be able to obey and to be holy. This was the solution that God had to counteract the sin that the world had been born into. And it wasn't an easy law. And it didn't leave one with hope of being able to fulfill that law. Throughout the Gospels, we see in the New Testament, the Pharisees over and over put on this act of being pious, didn't they? Put on this show that they were, they were walking in the law, that they were doing everything that they were supposed to do. But really, honestly, if you imagine what, what was going on inside their hearts, there's fear of getting caught. Because we know nobody is without sin. And I imagine the bigger the act that they put on, probably the bigger fear that they had of being caught in that sin. And while you can hide your sin from man, you cannot hide your sin from God, can you? It was like Adam and Eve who were in the Garden of Eden, and God comes walking and says, where are you? They were trying to hide from God, weren't they? But ultimately, God knew where they were, and he already knew what they had done. And all this talk of sin and law is kind of heavy, isn't it? It kind of leaves you feeling without hope. And I want to look at that word today. Our focus today is hope. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary says the definition of the word hope is to cherish or desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or to be true. Um, some of you know this year I've been house sitting for Pastor Jimmy and Priscilla, and along with house sitting, that means I'm dog sitting. They have two dogs. How many of you have met Max and Roxy? You never forget Max, do you? <laughs> Max is a trip and a half. Um, but these two dogs are probably the best example I can give you of what it means to be full of hope, okay? Because every day, If I'm in the kitchen cooking something, if I'm sitting at the table eating something, they are at my feet just waiting for me to drop something or give them something. It doesn't matter that they have food in their dish. It doesn't matter that I have no intention of giving them anything. They still sit there and they wait with anticipation, wanting it to happen. Knowing the way that sin lures us and how unattainable the law is, Hope would seem pretty ridiculous, wouldn't it, for a sinner? Why would you bother to have hope when there is so much fighting against hope? And if you didn't bother to read past Leviticus, you might think that things were absolutely hopeless. But thankfully, our Bible doesn't end there, does it? It continues on. And today we're going to look at some scriptures that foreshadow the future coming of the Messiah And these scriptures should leave us with hope 
So we're going to, um, as, as we learned earlier, the, let me just talk a little bit about who the Messiah was. That was kind of a big word that we used that, that represented the promised and the expected deliverer of the Jewish people. He would be their savior. He would be their redeemer. After the past two weeks, you would agree that the Jewish people, really the whole world, needed this savior, didn't they? We all need that savior. Because as we've seen on our own, we could never conquer sin, and we could never banish hell by ourselves by completing the law. God knew that as well. And he gave us free will so that our worship would be genuine. But that also allowed sin to enter into the world. He gave us the law so that, that we would know the expectation of how to live holy lives. But God already knew that because of sin, we could never live up to that law. He knew that, and so he created a plan. He created a beautiful plan for the Savior and the Messiah. And he shared that plan with us throughout the Bible. So I'm going to ask you to turn to Leviticus chapter 16. I know Leviticus is our law chapter, but this is going to set up what the need is for that Messiah. And so before we look at verses of prophecy, we're going to look at something called a foreshadowing. This is an event that happened in the Old Testament that was a picture of something that was going to happen in the future. Um, most of our prophecies are spoken words that were written down of something that's going to happen, but this, this is a little bit different in that it was an actual event that gave us a picture of what would happen. So Leviticus chapter 16, starting with verse 15. Verse 15 says, Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. And this is talking about the priest. Thus he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all of their sins. And so he shall do for the tent of meeting which dwells with them in the midst of their uncleanness. No one may be in the tent of meeting from the time he enters to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out and has made atonement for himself and for his house and for all the assembly of Israel. Then he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. And he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times and cleanse it and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the people in, of Israel. And when he had made, this, made an end of atoning for the holy place and the tent of meeting and the altar, he shall present the live goat. And Aaron shall lay both hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the people of Israel and all their transgressions, all their sins. And he shall put them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who is in readiness. The goat shall bear all their iniquities on itself to a remote area, and he shall let the goat go free into the wilderness. How many of you ever heard the term scapegoat before? Some of you here have heard that term. Turn to your neighbor and say scapegoat. Scapegoat. So we use that term when we're talking about someone or something that takes the blame for something that they did not do. Sometimes you see that in the corporate world when there's a big mistake in a company and somebody gets fired, even though they weren't the ones that caused it, but, but the shareholders insist somebody has to be fired. And so they pick somebody, usually pick somebody who's neutral, and they blame them, and they become a symbol of, of the punishment that was needed. So this scripture in Leviticus that we just read, is where the term scapegoat comes from. See, the second goat that they placed the sins on and sent away was the scapegoat. It took upon itself the blame that should have been on the people of Israel. It was a symbolic sending away of the sins of the people. 
But what we need to keep in mind is this was always a temporary solution, right? The Israelites would continue to sin, and each year an atonement would need to be made. Because we, we see in, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4, for it is impossible for the blood of goats, bulls and goats, to take away sins. So the scapegoat was really just a temporary solution. Now if you turn with me to Isaiah chapter 53, we're going to look at some scripture there. So the Israelites were going to need something permanent, weren't they? You couldn't each year, what if, what if somebody died during the year before that, that solution was made, before that scapegoat was sent? So they had to, God had to offer something that gave hope of a coming solution, and he did that through the prophet Isaiah. So Isaiah 53 verse 1 says, Who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgressions of my people, and they made his grave with the wicked, And with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put on him grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. And you have to read deeper into this to see the hope because really if you read these words, what we see is a lot of hardship, right? We see oppression, affliction, judgment, that his grave made his grave with the wicked. We see that he was crushed. They put him to grief over and over all these things. But the thing is all those things were born by the Messiah, were being carried by the Messiah. And how they can give us hope is because they should have been carried by us, right? These were all the things we should have gone through for our sins. We should have been the oppressed. We should have been the afflicted. We should have had our grave with the wicked. We should have been crushed. And we should have been put to grief. But the Messiah came. Like a lamb led to the slaughter. And that brings hope for each one of us. Verse 11 says, and he shall bear their iniquities. Iniquities is a fancy word that we use for sin. Jesus would come to bear the price for our sins. This passage is God pointing to providing a final, complete payment, a permanent solution 
for the problem of sin and hell. And all this points to one person. We're going to spend the rest of today looking at that Messiah and what his pro- prophesied coming meant to sin and what it meant to the world. The next week, we're going to take some time to look at the fulfillment of those prophecies through the birth of Jesus. It's going to be a beautiful way to end this series, looking at who we celebrate. And now we're going to, we're going to move into the New Testament. So if you have your Bibles, learn with, turn with me to John chapter 1. We're going to read some prophetic words by um, John the Baptist, who was sent as the prophet to declare the arrival of the Messiah. So John chapter 1, starting with verse 29. Verse 29 says, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who ranks before me, because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but for this purpose I came baptizing with water, that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness, I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So we see here John the Baptist telling us in verse 29 that Jesus is the Lamb of God. That is who he was baptizing here, and he saw the dove descend on him. The Lamb of God, which ties us back to the words in Isaiah, where Jesus would come to be the fulfillment of that sacrifice that was needed. Confirmation that Jesus would be the sacrificial lamb is seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, which says, For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. And then if we look at Hebrews 7, verse 27, we see that say, unlike the other high priests, he did not need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his sins and then for the sins of the people. He sacrificed for their sins once for all when he offered himself. Jesus became the once for all sacrifice covering yesterday, today, today, and tomorrow. Once for all means there was no more need of a scapegoat. There were no more temporary solutions that were needed. And this gives us a good transition into Hebrews chapter 10. So if you want to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. If you remember last week, we spent some time talking about the Old Testament covenant. And so today we're going to look at some scripture from Hebrews that shows us what this new covenant is all about. So we're going to start in verse 1 of Hebrews chapter 10. For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered year, every year, make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? Since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings, you take no pleasure. Then I said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, as it is written of me in the scroll of the book. When he said above, You have neither desired nor taken pleasure in sacrifices and offerings, and burnt offerings and sin offerings, and these were offered according to the law. Then he added, Behold, I have come to do your will. He does away with the first, talking about the covenant, the Old Testament covenant, in order to establish the second, and this is the new covenant. 
And by that, we will have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice of sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness for us. For after saying, this is the covenant that I will make for them after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. And then he adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. You know, we talked last week, we, we read some scripture in Hebrews, and we talked about how it was, it's a beautiful book to read through, and it's, but it's still very heavy. It takes time to process. So I'm going to encourage you to spend some time in the book of Hebrews. Um, chapter 8 through 10 is just beautiful, talking about that Old Testament covenant and how Jesus is the fulfillment into the New Testament covenant. It's a beautiful reminder of, of what Christmas is all about. But right now, I want to take you through a couple different verses. Um, just to help you understand a little bit of what these passages are saying. So verse number four says, For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. So we read this verse earlier, didn't we? We talked about how the Israelites were required to present bulls and goats, pigeons and other animals as a blood sacrifice in order to fulfill what Hebrews 9.22 says, Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified with blood. And without the shedding of blood... There's no forgiveness of sins. But see, then Jesus came, right? And Jesus lived a sinless life. And then he died in place of those sins and sacrifices. Verse 14 says, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And after the hopelessness that we've been seeing in the law, can you see how much hope is presented in those words? how much hope that would bring to the people of Israel, how much hope that brings to us. See, we went from being a people who had to be perfect, who had to strive for perfection, something that we could never be, to being a people who just had to accept a sacrifice that the Messiah made on our behalf. We go from people who are born into sin to becoming people who can have their sins forgiven and even have their sins forgotten. We go from people who cannot fulfill the law to people who just have to accept the sacrifice that was made on our behalf for that law. I want to share with you some words from an old hymn. We've sung it here before. It'll be familiar to most of you. But I want to read through these words because sometimes when we sing them, We don't really pay attention to everything that we're hearing, do we? And so I want to read through that. I want you just to listen as I go through this. Verse number one says, My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ, my righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. Verse three says, His oath, His covenant his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. Verse 4 says, When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. In him my righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. I love that last line. It says, in him, my righteousness alone. In him. It's not in me. It's not in anything that I can do and will ever be able to do, but in him alone. He makes us faultless to stand before the throne, something we could never do without his sacrifice. 
Romans 10, verses 9 and 10 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. I asked you a couple of weeks ago, does that sound too easy? And it really does, doesn't it? Sometimes I'm amazed at the people who, who can't and won't accept that because it is easy. There's nothing that you can do. You can try. You can try and you can try, but you will never fulfill that law yourself. All that God asks is for us to accept, confess, and believe. And I'm going to give you guys the opportunity for that right now. So I'm going to ask everybody to close their eyes. And today may be that day, as you're walking from, from hearing to us talk about sin and law and the hopelessness into this hope of the coming Messiah, and you're seeing the day is the day I need to make that decision to accept that Messiah as the Savior in my life. I'm going to ask if that's your decision today that you would raise your hand. Is there anybody here today that's ready to make that decision? Is there anybody here? Just a moment longer. There's no more important decision that you can make. Church, I'm going to ask us all to pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for providing a way out of the sin, of the punishments for my sin. Thank you for sending Jesus to die for me. Today, I trust in you, and I believe you are the God who raised Jesus from the dead. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If you raised your hand today, you may have somebody from our discipleship team um, stop by today. We've asked them, uh, we ask everybody to close our eyes except a couple people from our discipleship team, and they'll have a card for you today. So don't be surprised if somebody comes to find you. And for the rest of us, I want to encourage you to spend this week really thinking about who this Messiah is, who he is to you. Think about the sin that we live in. Think about the sin that we are being born away from. Because next week when we celebrate Christmas, if we don't truly understand who the Messiah is and why we need him, then that celebration isn't going to mean as much. So if you come with your hearts prepared, spending that time, finding out who he is, why he came, you're going to be ready for a beautiful celebration next Sunday. Church, let us pray. Jesus, I thank you for, for your sacrifice. I thank you that you are the Messiah. I thank you that those words that the prophet Isaiah gave to us about all the things that you would come to do, you did do those things and you fulfilled all of that prophecy. You became our Savior. Lord, we thank you. And I ask this week, as we prepare our hearts for celebrating Christmas next week, that you would help us throughout the week take the time to remember you, to remember why you were born, to remember the sacrifice that you did for us. So that next week, when we come here to gather together to celebrate you, it will be the most joyous celebration that we have ever had. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, church. Have a great Sunday.